Our next guest is Rabbi David Bendori of Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. Uh, he was on about a month ago on the show, maybe a little more than that, and he's on today to talk about uh, several topics very relevant, uh, both on the Jewish calendar and related to current events. Rabbi Bendori, thanks for coming on today. Pleasure to be here, Adam. Thanks for having me back. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about... Um, some new research and writing that you're doing under the general topic of, uh, this will be provocative to plenty, why Jews hate guns. Tell us about that. Indeed, it is provocative indeed. We've got some revolutionary insights that are going to be coming out from JPFO shortly. I did some research with Alan Corwin of GunLaws.com, and in conjunction with Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership, we have come up with an article addresses the this critical question of why Jews are so anti-gun. Some Jews are. The left-wing Jews are. I mean, you know... It is, G- it is by and large the left-wing Jews, and in fact, that's one of the one of the reasons that we talk about is the adulteration of the Jewish religion, adulteration and corruption of, of Jewish religion, and people doing things, quote-unquote, in the name of Judaism that really aren't Jewish at all. Something you sent me uh, mentions Charles Schumer, Barbara Boxer. Di- Diane Feinstein's not actually Jewish. She has a non-Jewish maternal great grand- maternal grandmother. But you mentioned her, Barney Frank, Frank Lautenberg, and Carl Levin. Carl Levin, I'm sorry. Um, wh- I mean, why are these people so out front? And they, in a lot of cases, such as Schumer, Boxer, uh, Barney Frank, they're particularly obnoxious. Uh, and I know a lot of gun owners see that and associate it with Jewish people in general. Why are them? Yeah. Well, why them in particular, I don't know. They are in positions, obviously, of liberal democratic leadership, and they have to be Jewish, and they, they, you know, carry that anti-gun flag with them, and they fly it high and with pride. Uh, Unfortunately, that comes to be associated with, quote-unquote, Jewish thinking on gun gun control, and it's, in fact, not Jewish at all. Nothing Jewish about it. One, you have a lot of great bumper stickers and shirts, and one I love that you guys have is... uh, a picture of Adolf Hitler with uh, his arm, you know, in the Heil Hitler. So I don't know why Hitler would actually be doing the Heil Hitler. So I guess he did do that in real life. Um, but he, uh, it says, uh, all in favor of gun control, uh, raise your right hand. It's just brilliant. Obviously, it's better as an image than me talking about it, especially when I sort of mess up the phrasing of it. But um, shouldn't Jews, of all people, be the most likely to support gun ownership, usually law-abiding people who are have certainly been threatened throughout history. In, indeed. One, one would think so, and that's why this question of why so many Jews are prominently anti-gun is, is such, a, such a surprising conundrum that we're placed in. Uh, we, we've got a new bumper sticker, by the way, that addresses that issue head-on, and it doesn't need a graphic to understand it. It simply says, gun control is not kosher. It's right. The JPFO lo- logo. So uh, you can uh, you can see that on our on our website as well. Um and yeah, jpofo.org. I want to emphasize that. And you know, to talk a little bit more to today, uh I guess a lot of Jews are of the belief that it can't happen here, but you know, they are invulnerable like a lot of white people in general to what has been going on in the news. I just read something right before the show about Virginia Beach, I guess it was, where members of the two white writers for, for the local paper there, the pilot, I think, uh, were attacked by a mob of like a hundred blacks and were just beaten and in a hospital for a hundred. These things are happening. And, uh, you know, this is maybe go beyond beyond the Jewish community, but I know there are some strong opinions. Jews for the f- preservation of firearms ownership wants to get out there to people too. And I got to thank your, I have to thank Kirby Ferris, who you work with over there too, for let's get the message out to people who may not otherwise hear it. Well, indeed, there have been uh, no fewer than three of these attacks. Uh, supposedly in response to the Trayvon Martin case. Just three? Um, I've heard a lot uh, more than that. Well, there's three prominent ones, I will call it, that that we highlighted in a recent article. Um, There was a mob in Alabama, uh, quite literally a mob, and they they beat a man into the ICU and said that's justice for Trayvon. Right. Uh, There was another situation where um, the suspect himself said that he had attacked a white teenager because he was angry over the Trayvon Martin case. Right. So he just came out and said it. And he, frankly, you know, maybe I'm reading in here, but he stated it with pride. Uh, and, uh, Thank you, these, big media. Yeah, well, these, these things have these things are going on here. Uh, in, in this particular issue that we're highlighting, Jews are not especially vulnerable more than uh, other law-abiding citizens are. 
Uh, but if you start talking about areas of terrorism and white supremacists and other kinds of areas, Jews most certainly are seen as targets in ways that others are not. Well, you mentioned white supremacists. I mean, how much real uh, violence is there being done by white supremacists? I mean, I hear that thrown around as if it's uh, occurring every day. There's not a whole lot of that that I see. I haven't heard of too many Jews being attacked by white supremacists. Fortunately, there have been very few actual attacks on Jews. Uh, the attacks have mostly been property attacks and vandalism. There are pr- plenty of swastikas being painted around and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, you know, today's news, there were uh, five, I think it was five anarchists arrested in Ohio plotting to blow up a bridge. You know, these are the uh, ultra-left. You've got the ultra-left and you've got the ultra-right, the right-wing supremacists uh, being uh, anti-Semitic and the left-wing uh, ultra-liberal being anti-Semitic because Jews are all capitalists. Let's talk no about uh, a little bit about the new Black Panther Party in particular, which uh, Eric Holder seems to have a soft spot for. Uh, how do they fit in here? Uh, I, do you want to call them ultra-right or ultra-left? Where do you want to put them? Uh, um, certainly in terms of uh, Eric Holder and, and his ilk, they're gonna, I'm going to label them ultra-left. Um, but, you know, these, the, that political spectrum wrap, wraps around. As for their anti-Semitism, we've seen plenty of anti-Semitism coming from black leadership historically. And I think we will see it here as well, uh, both both uh, publicly as well as in non-public statements. You know what? Let me revisit your um, your previous, something you previously brought up. Jews who simply go to synagogue and do their own thing, you know, they ha- may happen to live in a city, not necessarily an area where, well, Anywhere in a city is vulnerable now when mobs show up. But what do they need to start thinking about in terms of uh, protecting themselves? And, again, your colleague Kirby Ferris has probably written about this a little more than you have personally. But- right. Well, Kirk, Kirby likes making uh, specific recommendations that the specific farms have a hold of. In terms of um, that sort of mob violence, uh, Kirby has recommended the 12-gauge shotgun as, as the tool of protection. Uh, in terms of the street violence, He's, in his recent article, he recommended carrying a uh, 9mm compact pistol as being something you can carry with you all the time, unlike a shotgun, which you, know, you likely can't carry with you all the time. Explain what the differences between pis- the use of pistols and shotguns, etc., are for a very ignorant audience, maybe someone who's now feeling a little bit more uneasy, who's never owned a gun in their life, and, you know, frankly, that would describe a lot of Jews. Well, what I would comment is that you need the right tool for the right job and the right situation. Uh, to, to go to a very practical issue, you can't carry a shotgun with you everywhere you go. You certainly can't carry a shotgun discreetly, whereas a sidearm you can carry discreetly, a handgun you can carry discreetly. Having said that, the shotgun has uh, more firepower. That is, it has more stopping power uh, in terms of stopping an assailant. Uh, it's much bigger and more frightening um, certainly in terms of scaring someone away. Often when someone pulls out a gun in self-defense, they simply scare away an attacker and never actually have to fire a shot. A shotgun is certainly more menacing and frightening from that point of view. Um, yeah, it is more accurate at a distance. Uh, accuracy probably isn't the right word when you talk about a shotgun. A shotgun, of course, shoots sort of a spray as opposed to a bullet. It shoots uh, well, kind of what you load it with, but let's say buckshot. Um, it's shooting a, a spray, a cloud, which means that that's going to cover a larger surface area, easier to hit a target that's further away. Of course, if you're really trying to hit something at a distance, what you want is accuracy, which comes with a rifle. A uh, rifle has far more accuracy than either of uh, the other two choices. Um, on the other hand, for most of the situations that we as civilians likely to face, uh, a rifle is probably not a practical choice. But what it comes down to is really the right tool for the right job, for the right situation, what the, what is the self-defense weapon that you're most, most likely to have with you when you need it, where you need it, that is going to be able to protect you from whatever threat it is that you're facing? Yeah, Rabbi, we have a few more uh, minutes, and you are a rabbi in addition to a gun expert. And uh, as you know, we're in the Omer period right now. If, if I were if visible, you could see my beard of about uh, 22 days that I'm on right now. Um, no, it's more than that. I guess it's 23 24, now. 24. 24, yeah, but I'm counting the first day of Passover, too. Um, and this is very relevant to Jewish self-defense in particular. And I'm talking about Bar Kokhba and the revolt and also the holiday of Lagba Omer, where uh, one symbol are bows and arrows. 
Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and how uh, this ties the whole holiday period talks into Jewish self-defense? In, indeed, it all ties together, doesn't it? Well, Bar Kokhba led a rebellion against Roman oppression. Um, his rebellion took place in, I believe, it started in the year 132 of the Common Era, if I'm not mistaken. He was endorsed by Rabbi Akiva, who was one of the leading rabbis of the time. Bar Kokhba had an enormous army. They fought against the Roman legions, and for several years they were winners. They did a great job. Uh, throwing off Roman oppression of the Jewish people. Now, during the Omer period, um, we are told it's a period of mourning because of the death of Rabbi Akiva's students. Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 pairs of students who died during this period. One of the suggestions about their death is that they were actually killed by the Romans. Um, you can read all about this in Devin Spears' book, for example. He writes all about it in the future. So it wasn't just a plague. Um, so one suggestion, the, the plague is very mysterious, right? If you read the Gemara on this, the Gemara talks about that they were killed by a plague called Azkara because they didn't behave the kavod with dignity toward each other. Uh, it's not really clear what that means. It's a rather mysterious plague. And one of the suggested explanations is that, in fact, it wasn't a plague, that, in fact, um, this was part of uh, Bar Kokhba's army, uh, that uh, we had... The rabbinic scholarship of the generation, the rabbinic scholars of the generation were part of the army fighting against the Romans, and the Romans brutally put down the uprising and killed all of Rabbi Akiva's students, both those who may have participated and those who did not, uh, as part of that. Of course, the Roman censors certainly would not have tolerated writing that up in the, the, uh, the notes in the study hall that turned into our Talmud eventually. Um. Um, and in terms of specific lessons we can draw from uh, this in terms of uh, Jewish self-defense or self-defense in general, because I know we have a lot of Christian listeners and people who follow the show. I, I think that uh, we should shake off the idea that um, violence is always bad. Using violence as a tool to defend the innocent, using a handgun as a tool to defend the in- innocent, is standing up for God's law and God's way. That's the lesson. one of the many lessons of the Bar Kokhba rebellion is that Bar Kokhba stood up in righteousness against Roman oppression. And righteous defense of the innocent is a religious mandate that we are required to uphold. God has given us a precious gift of life, and to not defend that life when it is attacked is in fact to hold the gift in contempt. So out of love for God, out of love for the life he gave me, I will defend the lives of the, of, of the innocent, of myself, of my family, against any threat. Even your community. In fact, that almost ties into George Zimmerman, who was not Jewish, but certainly was asked by community members to help uh, defend his community after a plague of not necessarily murders, but uh, theft and attacks on people's homes. Uh, could you tie that in there? Well, it's certainly appropriate to defend our communities. It's certainly appropriate to have something like a neighborhood watch to protect the community. There are actually Jewish communities that have such things. Um, you know, obviously, the details of that case now, frankly, we, the public, probably never will know the full details of that case. Um, but, you know, a defensive, uh, a defensive shooting, a man who's uh, got scrapes on the back of his head and has been attacked and so on, uh, is certainly allowed to, to, to act in defense and to use deadly force uh, in order to, to strike down a threat to his life. I want to take a few more minutes while I have you on to just really be relentless in getting the message to people Wake up. This is what you have to do. Tell us, in that context, what you expect from a long, hot summer, to use a euphemism that, like, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson and even Barack Obama, uh, well, Obama hasn't used that term yet, but you know what I'm talking about here. And uh, what do we expect in terms of a long, hot summer? A long, hot summer is not good for social unrest, plain and simple. Uh, people get irritable, um, and uh, people look for easy targets to take out that irritability. Um, Jews are uh, historically always been considered easy targets, unfortunately. Um, and we need to make ourselves into not so easy targets, in fact, not targets at all. Um, you know, when you stop and consider uh, that there are synagogues in Wisconsin, for example, that in response to the constitutional carry bill, constitutional carry law that was passed, they have up signs that said no firearms allowed in the synagogue. They effectively hung up a sign that said we're an easy target. I'm guessing these right. were not observant synagogues. <laughs> um, well, they've all been called temples, which tells right. me that they are 
uh, likely not Orthodox synagogues. Well, you're right. only you're safe if uh, you go there because you're probably only there on Rosh Hashanah, maybe one day, and uh, Yom Kippur anyhow. So for the most part, it's not like you're going to be going to the morning minion if you go to a Reformed temple. The two of the most vulnerable days of the year in terms of uh, opportunities to attack the Jewish community. Right. Um, yeah, the, the entire community is in the synagogue with a big sign that says uh, no firearms allowed up over the entrance. Uh, that's, that's not a safe place to be, if you ask me. So what do you want to tell uh, a Jew who doesn't have any firearms, who lives, say, in a fairly nice area, goes to a conservative synagogue, or more likely doesn't go to a conservative synagogue, and have the mentality that many in Germany and many places in our history have had that, that can't happen to you, I have nothing to worry about, let's not exaggerate, that's for crazy people. What do you want All to right. tell those people? So here's what I'll tell you. Maybe you're right, but what harm is it going to do to go out and learn to shoot a firearm? You're a Jew. You should at least know how to shoot a firearm, how to handle it safely, at the very least. And at the very least, go learn that and get some information so you can make an informed and intelligent decision about firearms rather than having a knee-jerk reaction that perhaps is what you were brought up with and never actually evaluated. And what do you tell a Jew who doesn't live in a wealthy area, who's in a perhaps a little bit more vulnerable area, uh, and uh, is on a budget in terms of purchasing firearms? Firearms can certainly be purchased with a budget. Um, you can certainly buy used firearms. You can buy perfectly good used firearms. And uh, there's there's plenty out there that can be done with a budget. In fact, if you go to jpfo.org, on our website there, Kirby's latest two articles talk about firearm purchases on a budget and exactly how to uh, arm yourself um, with just a small investment uh, and yet be well protected. Uh, you know what? I want to ask you one other thing, or maybe more than one thing. Uh, I don't know where our other guest is, but um, we talked a lot about Long Hot Summer, and that's obviously a reference to black mobs, but you have a film called that's ironically titled No Guns for Negroes, and uh, that is about how blacks have been deprived of uh arms ownership through the years. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? And that'll, that'll probably be the last question I have for you. Sure. History of gun control that most people don't want to tell you, which is that the first gun control laws in America were passed as a tool of oppression to, pro to keep the black slaves or newly free black slaves, depending on where you look in history, uh, down and uh, to prevent them from striking back. So uh, Mississippi had explicitly racial gun laws that prevented former slaves from owning firearms. The history of gun control in America is a history of racism and oppression. Um, coming all the way up, really, to the, to the 20th century, and No Guns for Negroes is a film that we did that tells the story of gun control as a tool of oppression to oppress black people. Rabbi David Ben-Dori, wishing you a happy Lagba Omer and uh, a worthwhile rest of the Omer period, though it sounds like you certainly know the messages of it. And uh, thanks for coming on today, uh, Today, and people should uh, definitely check out Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership's webpage at jpfo.org. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Adam, thanks so much for having me, and enjoy your log film there as well.